tonight on NJTV News, NJ Transit will be back on track tomorrow. We'll tell you what the track's owners knew, what Christie threatened, and what's next. Millennials are rethinking how and where they'll live, and urban planners and realtors are scrambling to get in step. Newark's consent decree under a microscope does the state's former top cop who oversees it fear it will be scrapped. And to sleep? Perchance to dream. Psychologists try to decipher how and why we dream. Say, there's the rub. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Live from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. The governor's calling for a full court press by New Jersey's congressional delegation to hold Amtrak accountable for its successive failures. This after the Amtrak CEO confessed the railroad knew that track was trouble before Monday's New York derailment became New Jersey's commuter nightmare. Brenda Flanagan reports Charles Wick Moorman began his news conference with an apology. I want to personally apologize to everyone who's been inconvenienced by all of the delays and cancellations we've had here at New York Penn Station because of the recent incident. Amtrak's autopsy of Monday's derailment showed old wooden railroad ties did not properly support the tracks. Under the train's weight, they slid apart, the wheels slipped off, and Amtrak knew about this because it had inspected the tracks after the Acela derailment two weeks ago. We had notations that these timbers needed to be replaced. We clearly did not have uh, the, uh, the understanding that there was an imminent failure. And we knew that at points in, some point this year in our maintenance program, we would be getting to it. Clearly, that was something that where we got it wrong. We've asked them to step up their game. They haven't. And so maybe I will get their attention by not paying them. An exasperated Governor Christie last night fired off an angry letter telling Amtrak New Jersey Transit would withhold its monthly two and a half million dollar rental fee for using New York's Penn Station because the derailments indicate Amtrak does not take its obligations seriously and has not effectively applied NJ Transit's considerable payments to the proper maintenance of these assets. We just made a bulk 62 and a half million dollar payment to Amtrak. I have no problem with making the payments but you've got to use the money to put the tracks in the right condition. I understand the governor is upset and he has a right to be upset. I will say that withdrawing funding is not going to solve any of the problems. Democrats supported withholding payments to Amtrak. The governor has every right not to make payments to Amtrak until they fix this problem. Commuters from the north and part of the state are seriously inconvenienced by what happened. And in state budget hearings, Democrats also criticized the Christie administration for chronically underfunding NJ Transit. The legislature's done their job with the Transportation Trust Fund, but clearly New Jersey Transit's sort of been like the redheaded stepchild under this administration. The governor notes NJ Transit just got a $140 million boost in Transportation Trust Fund money, and his state treasurer defended NJ Transit funding. We think that there's an appropriate level of resources going to transit. More worrisome, the Trump administration's cut critical funding for the Gateway Railroad Tunnel Project under the Hudson. Senator Cory Booker criticized the move, especially in light of Amtrak's double derailment. My office phone is blowing up. There is anger. There is frustration. The busiest river crossing in North America is the Hudson River crossing. And yet our infrastructure is outrageously out of date. The president was evasive in a New York Times interview, saying he'll appoint a commission to study infrastructure projects, including Gateway. Oh, God. 
we can't afford a commission to study it. We don't have the time. There's no need to study this problem. It's been studied. There's enough historical information on this. Even his side knows it has to be fixed. Meanwhile, Governor Christie says he will speak with Amtrak's chairman later tonight about what it will take for Jersey to start paying rent again. Amtrak says it expects tomorrow's rush hour to be back to normal. In Whippany, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. A boil water advisory in Bergen County. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Ridgewood, where residents have been told to boil their water after groundwater tested positive for E. coli. The contamination zone also includes parts of Wyckoff and all of Glen Rock. Water contaminated with E. coli could cause diarrhea, cramps, nausea, and headaches. Most at risk, infants and children, the elderly, and people with compromised immune systems. Next to Jersey City, where the most storied high school boys basketball program in state history is closing. Through dwindling financial straits, St. Anthony's remained a rare, affordable private basketball powerhouse, headed by one of the winningest coaches in the country. Under coach Bob Hurley, the Friars took 28 state titles and four national championships and became a recognized feeder school for NCAA colleges. St. Anthony's would not hike tuition, and the Newark Archdiocese has decided St. Anthony's fervent fundraising efforts won't cover the cost of operating, so it's closing this June. Marist in Bayonne is on the brink of closure as well. Finally, New Brunswick, where just ahead of Passover, Rutgers University's Hillel has its first permanent home. The Hillel claims Rutgers has the biggest Jewish undergraduate population of any college in the U.S., but for 50 years, they've been nomads moving among rented spaces. Now they have the Eva and Ari Halpern Hillel House on College Ave, where they can congregate and celebrate Shabbat dinners. The mezuzah at the entrance to the brand new building was dedicated by Holocaust survivor Edward Mossberg. And that's our Garden State Express for Thursday, April 6th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. After two generations of out-migration, millennials are reversing course, leaving their parents' leafy suburbs and returning to urban centers where they can live and play and work, or at least access reliable mass transit to get there. And the impact of their new migratory pattern on the economy is only now beginning to be measured, Brianna Venosi reports. All you have to do is look at the value per square foot of a Jersey City condo, compare it to the McMansions sprawling the outskirts of a New Jersey suburb. For the first time in at least half a century, walkable towns, particularly urban, are gaining market share over their counterparts. I think it really appeals to everybody. It's appealing to millennials right now because Frankly, a lot of millennials grew up in the suburbs and said, well, this is boring or this isn't the kind of life that I want. They're finding that. And, you know, it doesn't really just mean living in New York City and it doesn't just mean living in the largest city. Walkable urbanism can happen in the context of anywhere. As housing and lifestyle preferences shift, George Washington University's Center for Real Estate and Urban Analysis is tracking the trend toward urban walkable places, reshaping the landscape. We found 149 walkable urban places. 31 of them are in New Jersey. New Jersey's doing pretty well in walkability, but they need to do better, and I think some places are getting it. These are neighborhoods where you can get to your local grocer, coffee shop, school or restaurant by foot, even bike or public transit. Places like Princeton, downtown Jersey City and Hoboken, but even Trenton and downtown Linden. We've got a giant asset in New Jersey. This huge, valuable asset, which is a lot of rail stations. Now, I work in cities around the country. Places would kill to have commuter rail and the kind of transit. Study co-author Michael Rodriguez says data show walkable towns improve the economy, create jobs, additional tax revenue, and boost overall economic output. So many of those office parks were built because we had companies that had 1,000 plus employees. Is that a thing of the past? It's a good question. And I think it's all market driven. And one of the things I should tell you is our philosophy is very free market advocates. So when you think about how the market drives certain things, the market right now is saying that 
those suburban office parks where you have 100 plus acres, it's really not the model anymore. It's very costly to maintain. Uh, a lot of times the folks have to drive to and from. And even though the metropolitan region of New York, New Jersey and Connecticut has over 22 million residents, just 2.4 percent of the region's land is walkable urbanism. I think there have been some dynamic, uh, dr dramatic uh, improvements here in the city. Clearly, NJ Pack was sort of the initial spark, but so much more has happened recently. The Haynes buildings, but there are other things. There's residential development that's going on. Uh, much of it's still publicly assisted and needing some support. Downtown Newark is one example of an emerging walk up that's also meeting social equity challenges. In other words, avoiding gentrification, at least so far, by building more mixed income and multi ethnic places. Advocates want policymakers to listen up. The cost of regulation and development in New Jersey is expensive. It could take upwards of over a decade to develop something, which is way too long to, uh, you know, there's momentum now for these types of products and we should jump on it now. The reality is these walkable places have impact on real estate value, but the unanswered question is how much they'll retain in the next 25 to 30 years once those millennials have grown. In Newark, Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. Standing by now with a look at today's business news is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda, we're number one. <laughs> Mary Alice, I don't think we want to be. This probably won't come as any surprise to New Jersey homeowners. The Garden State once again had the highest property taxes in the country last year. According to a study published by RealtyTrack.com, the mean property tax bill in New Jersey was just over $8,500 in 2016. Essex County property owners have the highest taxes with an average of more than $11,500. New Jersey also has the highest effective property tax rate at 2.31%. The New Jersey Supreme Court is reviewing two cases where chain restaurants are accused of not listing alcohol prices on their menus. Both cases involve restaurant goers claiming they were charged different prices for the same beverage. The cases involve a TGI Fridays in Mount Laurel and a Caraba Italian Grill in Maple Shade. The New Jersey Law Journal reports the plaintiffs argued the restaurant chains engaged in price gouging. What do you do with a shopping mall with a lot of unoccupied retail space? How about turn it into a soccer arena or a casino or a medical marijuana treatment center? All those ideas are under consideration for Patterson's struggling Center City Mall. The mall opened seven years ago, but more than a third of its space is empty, according to NorthJersey.com. Next week, Patterson council members are reportedly expected to vote on some of the proposals designed to give the mall new life. There is a recall of defective asthma inhalers made by GlaxoSmithKline. More than 593,000 Ventolin inhalers are being recalled across the country because they may not give the correct dosage of medication when used because they leak. The affected inhalers with several different lot numbers have expiration dates of March 18th and April 18th. On Wall Street, stocks closed slightly higher with the Dow up about 15 points. And those are our top business stories for this Thursday. Christie ally Bill Baroni, convicted and sentenced in the Bridgegate scandal, has been disbarred. Unless his conviction is overturned on appeal, the former deputy executive director of the Port Authority can no longer practice law. Meantime, former state attorney general Peter Harvey is now monitoring Newark's police consent decree for the U.S. Department of Justice. He's set to deliver the annual Byrne Lecture on the powers and purpose of the attorney general. Michael Hill spoke with him. Uh, Mr. Harvey, thanks so much for talking to us. Uh, what's the future of the consent decree in Newark? Well, I think it's going to be as, the, as it is written. Um, remember, the consent decree is a settlement agreement. It's a written agreement signed by both parties. So just because one party says, I'm not sure I want to pursue this anymore, it doesn't mean anything. The other party uh, has a right to say, no, you're going to do exactly what you agreed to do. And remember now, once the two parties have signed it, it's not just a contract. It's been filed in federal court. So now it's under the supervision of a federal court. 
So you have both parties to the agreement now having filed in federal court what has become a court order. So um, I, I, I know, I'm pretty confident that um, the city of Newark is going to continue the reforms that we are seeing taking place and taking hold for the next five years. The judge in a case like this typically would not allow either side to drag its feet, to renege, to retreat? Well, that's one of the reasons you have a judge. You have, and here we have a very good judge, a very smart judge, and a very thoughtful judge who has been carefully supervising the consent decree and carefully um, asking questions of not only me as the independent monitor, but of the parties at various status conferences that the court holds from time to time to explore the, uh, the progress being made under the consent decree. You said a very interesting word in this process. You said independent. Yes. What does that mean in a case like this? Very good question. The two parties to the consent decree don't trust one another to verify compliance. So the Department of Justice does not trust Newark to um, self-report its compliance. Newark doesn't trust the other party, the Department of Justice, to necessarily fairly evaluate its compliance. And so the two sides pick a third party, a neutral, uh, an independent monitor, to come in and verify uh, whether or not provisions have been completed or whether or not actions have been undertaken to complete those provisions or whether or not there is some stage of completion being undertaken by the Newark uh, police. And so I have been agreed to by the parties and appointed by the court to be the independent monitor. And it's not just coming in with a clipboard to check boxes to say you've done this, you haven't done that. It's also to provide technical assistance. So I have a monitoring team made up of police professionals who make suggestions. We don't run the police and we don't wish to run the police. The Newark police have a very good and very able police director, Anthony Ambrose. And so our goal is to identify cities that have implemented modern policing techniques and to make suggestions to Newark to observe those cities and then take from those cities the policies and the training that are adaptable for the city of Newark and mold them, tailor them uh, into a program that's useful for Newark. So, Mr. Harvey, despite the change in Washington, despite some of the language coming out of Washington, which seems to be retreating on some of these agreements or at least police reforms in several cities in America, the people in Newark can be confident that because you're involved and because of these signed agreements that real reform will take place in the city of Newark. Yes, but not because I'm involved. <laughs> I, would, I, wouldn't, I don't hold myself in that high regard. We've seen you but, in action. We've heard you speak, so we kind. know what you're capable of. You're very kind. I, I can tell you this, that I don't see any change in the implementation of this consent decree. And uh, I'm going to make sure that I'm doing everything and the monitoring team is doing everything we can to be of assistance. You're going to see in the next couple of months probably the introduction of body cameras with the Newark police. You're going to see in the next couple of months the introduction of car cameras. Uh, you're going to see uh, new policies with respect to the use of force. Use of force meaning uh, drawing your weapon, using your weapon, using um, physical force with residents on the street and accompanying those policies. Remember, it's not just a policy. You have to also train everybody in the police department on the new policy. And you have to do adult-based learning training, meaning you give people scenarios and you invite them to think through the policy and give you answers based upon the scenarios that you've given. You don't simply give a lecture and tell people, here's what you have to do, A, B, C, D, E, F. You create factual scenarios and invite the audience to comment about what it thinks it should do and whether that is the right approach or not the right approach based upon uh, the training module that you implement. Mr. Harvey, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. from LGBT advocates who say the U.S. Census Bureau's decision to exclude from the next census questions regarding sexual orientation and gender identity keeps their needs closeted. Aaron Delmore reports. 
Three years to go until the next census, but the questions are due now. And much to the dismay of LGBT groups nationwide, a chunk of previously drafted questions have suddenly been left out. So when you don't count a group of people, they're essentially invisible when it comes to any type of federal funding or government grants. And so when there's zero people represented from the LGBT community in the census, people will look at that data and have no idea how many resources are needed to help the community. Two sections of proposed questions were removed from a draft submitted to Congress by the Census Bureau. They focused on sexual orientation and gender identity. A lot of health organizations receive federal funding for STDs, HIV and AIDS, um, certain types of cancer that specifically are at higher rates in the LGBT community. If we aren't recorded, then there's no argument for federal agencies to provide more funding to address these needs. LGBT rights groups say it's a low blow by the Trump administration and a harbinger of social policy to come. The LGBT community being counted on the census has been an important issue to our people for decades. And we are moving in the right direction. There's absolutely no reason why we should not count the LGBT community. It's, it's a direct attack from the Trump administration to LGBT people, and it's disgusting. Well, it's pretty frightening that uh, already they're trying to make believe LGBT people don't exist as if we're not Americans. And we had finally made a lot of progress to include ourselves in the country's population. We are taxpayers. We're hardworking people. We deserve to be counted in every census. It's ridiculous. Do you think that the changes we've seen in the draft questions for the 2020 census are a reflection of the Trump administration? I believe they certainly are. Assemblyman Tim Eustace is a co-sponsor of legislation to include voluntary questions on sexual orientation and gender identity in some surveys administered by the state. What I keep telling people is we have to build our own wall to protect our own citizens, and that's what we're attempting to do. Assemblyman Eustace says it's not just LGBT people who'll be affected. He called it the tip of the iceberg. It gets to be all of the people that have been called PC over the years who wish to be identified as who they are. If a Native American wishes to be called a Native American, that should be their choice. And on and on down the line. And what they're trying to do is dismantle what they called PC, which is actually respect for our citizenry. And it's important that we pay attention as every day goes by as they dismantle respect for the citizens of this country. For NJTV News, I'm Erin Dalmore. Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. It's one of the behavioral sciences' greatest unanswered questions. Why do we dream? The ancients believed the soul wandered as the body slept. Modern psychology has less poetic but more practical theories. Lauren Wonka reports on the stuff that dreams are made of. We hop into bed, pull over the covers, drift off to sleep, and eventually step into another world of sorts, dreamland. One of the questions is, does, does everyone dream? There are some people who say, I never dream. Everyone dreams, um, and it's just a matter of whether you remember the dreams or not. Why do we dream? It's a great question. I wish I could answer it. There, there is no actual definitive answer about why we dream, so there are lots of theories. Psychiatrist Dr. Ramon Salka says Freud believed dreams represented our unconscious thoughts. So by analyzing dreams, he could get a better understanding of who people are and, and what made them tick. As we um, let our defenses down each night, as we're relaxing and as we're beginning to fall into that sleep, um, our brain starts to um, share those deep buried thoughts about what we think about, what we're made of, our experiences in the past, and that's what dreams uh, represent. Others believe in a more biologically based theory. It's really our brain resetting, so it's our brain's way of organizing our memories. Some people think that the link between sort of that unconscious view and the biological is that there are those neurons or the brain cells that are firing, and so as you get a fragment of a memory, your brain tries to make sense of that, and that becomes the dream. So that's part of the reason why dreams are often unusual or weird um, or don't always make sense, because it's just a fragment of it, and your brain is really trying to make sense of the experience. Sleep is a restorative process. There are several stages. Dreams typically occur during REM sleep. Rapid eye movement. This is an example of what a person's brainwaves look like in REM sleep. 
when we were first beginning to observe people doing sleep studies, we noticed that people's uh, eyelids would flutter and that their eyes would be fluttering underneath uh, while they were sleeping. And so that's how you know you're in that uh, segment of sleep. People usually dream four to six times each night, and they're not always good dreams. Dr. Solka says there's no specific reason why most people have nightmares. They're simply bad dreams. But for others, those nightmares could be a symptom of a more severe sleep disorder night terrors. That's treated here at the Center for Sleep Medicine at Jersey Shore University Medical Center. Those who suffer from depression and anxiety like PTSD may be at an increased risk for nightmares and insomnia. Some of the medications used to treat depression and anxiety can interrupt and affect dreams, says the doctor. Still, humans aren't the only ones who dream. There's some uh, studies that show that, um, in fact, all mammals dream. Um, so that, you know, the, the belief is that, um, well, we don't know since we can't obviously talk to the animals that they're dreaming, but they clearly have the rapid eye movement portion of the sleep cycle. Dr. Solka isn't surprised researchers still don't have a firm answer on why we dream because of how complex the brain is. But with medical advances in brain imaging and other technology, he expects the medical community will have a better understanding about dreams over the next 10 to 20 years. 20 years. I'm Lauren Wonko, NJTV News. Tomorrow on NJTV News, years after the horrific Avalon fire, efforts to alter building codes to make homes safer. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thanks for being here. See you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities.